Hey guys, this is Landon with the Command Valley, bringing you a budget upgrade guide for the Reap the Tides pre-constructed commander deck being released alongside Commander Legends. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring our channel. If you want to check out their new and improved store and support the channel while doing so, check out the link in the description below. We have a copy and pasteable list in the description that you can paste right in their deck builder and buy the singles that you see in this episode right then and there. If you want to support the channel directly, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley to sign up today. So for this episode, I'll be be taking 11 cards out of the Reap the Tides pre-constructed deck and putting 11 cards I think will improve the deck while staying on a budget around $20. These pre-constructed decks are an amazing product that Wizards of the Coast produces. They're really cheap. I think they're around 20 bucks and they're ready to play right out of the box. That means you don't have to put any cards into it. You can sit down, pull this out of the box and play with it with your friends. And from our testing with the Zendikar Rising pre-constructed decks, they're actually pretty strong for how cheap they are. And they're like, like I said earlier, they're an amazing product. There are always ways of improving a deck and that's what I'm gonna be trying to do today. So let's take a look at the deck, see the strengths and the strategies of the deck, maybe highlight a couple of cards just to kind of get a feel for what this deck is trying to do. So let's start with the commander, ASC Tyrant of God. Dire Strait. Ayasi is a legendary creature serpent that costs four green and a blue, and it reads you can play an additional land on each of your turns. And whenever a land enters a battlefield under your control, you may draw a card, and it's a 5-5. Five five. So this is a super powerful commander, letting us play an additional land on each of our turns and then rewarding us for playing lands with card draw is super powerful. That's one of the strengths of green and blue is ramp and card draw, and to have that on a commander, super great. So this is going to be a really powerful deck that has a lot of potential. So let's look at some of the strategies in the deck. So we're going to see some landfall abilities, cards like Rampaging Bailoths, Spore Mound, or Avenger of Zendikar. There are others, but these are probably the strongest. They reward us by giving us creature tokens whenever we play a land, or Avenger of Zendikar makes us a bunch of lands when it comes into play, but grows the tokens that it gives us whenever we play land. So these cards really help us close out the game and really reward us for playing a lot of lands. And I'd like to stop here and mention too that the deck is running a total of 44 lands, which is exactly what we want to see in a landfall deck. I see a lot of landfall decks on lists on the internet that are only playing, you know, 35 to 37 lands, and I honestly feel like that's just not enough for a landfall deck. We really don't want to be running out of lands to play because so much of the deck is focused around that. Another big part of the deck that I've noticed is big nasty sea creatures. Cards like Stormtide Leviathan or Tromocratus or Trench Behemoth. These are massive sea monsters. And I know that there are, all, there are a lot of people, myself included, that love these sea creatures. So seeing these in the deck also is super cool. And then we've got some really powerful creatures that are not sea creatures like Terastodon, which when it comes into play, we can destroy a bunch of non-creature permanents that our opponents control or Verdant Sun's Avatar that gives us a bunch of life because we're playing lots of big creatures, or Molimo Mara Sorcerer that, again, kind of capitalizes on us playing a lot of lands. It's going to get bigger equal to how many lands we control. The deck is also playing a bunch of ramp spells that we'll see in the, the non-creature category cards like Search for Tomorrow or Kodama's Reach and Cultivate. Let us get extra lands into play, extra lands into our hand, and that is certainly a strategy that we're going to be leaning into heavily when you see the upgrades. So now that we've gotten a better understanding of, of what the deck is trying to do, it's all about ramp, it's all about big creatures and hitting our opponents with these big creatures, let's go over the cards that I'm going to be taking out of the deck. A quick disclaimer, I'm not suggesting that any of these cards that I'm taking out are bad and that you shouldn't play them in any deck or necessarily in this deck. Just after me evaluating the deck itself, these are the cards that I felt were a little out of place, maybe didn't have quite as much synergy with the deck as I would like, or I felt like had a better replacement. So I'm going to be going over uh, each card one at a time and mentioning and talking about the card that I'm putting in in its place. So starting off with Yavi Maya Elder. When Yavi Maya Elder dies, we can search our library for two basic lands and put them into our hand, shuffle our library. We can then pay two generic mana to sacrifice it to draw a card. So like I said, this card isn't bad. It has a lot of potential in the deck, getting us extra lands into our hand that we can play with our commander late game is super sweet, something that we want to do. However, with our commander costing six mana, I kind of feel like I would prioritize getting lands into play quicker than that extra late game utility. And for that, I'm putting in Wood Elves. It has the same converted mana cost essentially. And when Wood Elves comes into play, we can search our library for a force and put it directly into play. I think Wood Elves is just 
more efficient throughout the whole game whereas i feel like yavi maya elder is really only great in the late game so that's why i put wood elves in next up i'm taking out wicker bow elder it enters the battlefield with a minus one counter on it and we can pay a green to remove a minus one counter from it to destroy an artifact or enchantment i feel like this ability is a little bit expensive it costs a total of five mana it's kind of on par with acidic slime but acidic slime can hit more things so i'm taking wicker burrow elder out for spring bloom druid i'd much rather have a creature that can put two lands into play and trigger our landfall abilities trigger our commander ramp us even more than a one-off destroy target artifact or enchantment ability that's a little bit overcosted. Next up, I'm taking out Shark to Crab in place for Somber Wild Sage. So Shark to Crab is definitely a super cool card. I remember drafting the heck out of Simic in the recent Ravnica set. So definitely a soft spot in my heart. And I, I kind of feel like that adaptability was a little bit lackluster and just a one-off tap down a creature and opponent controls. Not super great. Um, I feel like Somber Wild Sage will give us a lot more value throughout the game. Somber Wild Sage can tap and give us three mana of any one color that we can only spend to cast creature spells. The deck is primarily creature spells and also very big creature spells at that so having a black lotus that we can tap every turn for creatures i feel like that's a little broken so if we can get this down on turn two or turn three we can get our commander out on turn four which is super powerful the next card that i'm cutting is fathom mage um, it has an evolve ability so whenever a creature enters the battlefield under our control if it had greater power or toughness than the fathom mage we put a plus one plus encounter on fathom mage and then whenever a plus one plus encounter is placed on it we can draw a card that is a decent amount of value it requires a little bit of setup and sequencing so i'm taking this out for tatiova i'm honestly surprised tatiova wasn't already in the deck it's basically a second copy of our commander without the extra land ability whenever a land enters a battlefield under our control tatiova will gain us life and draw a card this requires less setup is a little bit less conditional and is a lot more useful in the deck and will give us a lot more value throughout the game than fathom mage next up i'm taking out Slinvoda the Rising Deep for Boundless Realms. Slinvoda is a very powerful big beater. It is an 8-8 with a kicker ability for one in a blue. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, we return all creatures to their owner's hands, except for Merfolk, Krakens, Leviathans, Octopus, and Serpents. So we are playing a lot of these sea creatures that won't get bounced with it, but we do have a lot of token makers, and we don't really want to be bouncing our own tokens. And I feel like 10 mana for a board wipe is kind of a little bit expensive, so I'm taking it out for Boundless Realms. So Boundless Realms is a seven mana sorcery. We can search our library for X basic land cards where X is the number of lands we control and we can put them all into play tapped. So I feel like doubling how many lands we have in play and getting all of those landfall triggers is so much better than a 10 mana board wipe. Uh, Boundless Realms can on, is such a bomb. Honestly, a lot of times it can just win us the game with how much value it'll give us. So I feel like it's definitely worth including. Next up, I'm cutting Sphinx of Uthun. It is a massive Sphinx that when it enters a battlefield, we kind of do a factor fiction. So we reveal the top five cards of our library. An opponent separates those cards into two piles. One goes into our hand, the other goes into our graveyard. Seven mana is just a lot for this effect and a 5-6 flying that is really good but I honestly kind of want to lower the curve just a little bit of the deck so I'm putting Haro in in its place. Haro is an instant speed we can sacrifice a land search our library for two lands put them into play shuffle our library. So we kind of have to look at what Haro can do once we have set up with our landfall abilities with our commander out um, we can just get a ton of value out of it. Haro is a card that we want to see early game, it's a card that we want to see late game, whereas Sphinx of Uthun, we really only want to see that later in the game, and even then, I feel like putting lands into play is just going to be better for us in the long run. Next up, along the same vein of thought, I'm taking Compulsive Research out for Roiling Regrowth. The deck doesn't really need um, the type of effect that Compulsive Research offers us. I feel like Roiling Regrowth is just going to be better almost every time. Uh, instant Speed, getting two lands into play versus Instant Speed, just drawing two cards. Our deck isn't really hurting for the card draw, so yeah, I think Roiling Regrowth is just going to be better. Next up, this is a little bit of an interesting uh, one for one trade. We have Ire Ruin Expedition. It is an enchantment that whenever a land enters a battlefield under our control, we put a quest counter on it. And then once there are three quest counters on it, we can sacrifice it and draw two cards. It's not a bad card. Um, I just kind of feel like Thwart will be a lot better in the deck. Thwart is a two and two blue uh, counter spell. We can counter any spell or we can return three islands that we control to our hand to instead of paying the mana cost and we still get to counter any spell. So I really like Thwart because we do have a lot of really big spells in the deck and a lot of times we're going to be having to tap out to, to play our big creatures and it's going to feel really bad to do that. So being able to tap out and still be able to interact with our opponents is super powerful. 
and returning lands to our hand is not a downside because our commander lets us put more lands into play and we really want to abuse those landfall triggers anyway so i feel like thwart is all upside in this deck Next up, I'm cutting Meteor Golem for Multani Yavimaya's Avatar. So, Meteor Golem is a decent removal spell, a little bit overcosted. When it enters a battlefield, it can destroy any non land permanent and opponent controls. It can hit a lot of things, but honestly, I just feel like the deck doesn't really need it that badly. And I think Multani is just a better card. Multani has Reach and Trample, and it gets plus one, plus one for each land card we control and each land card in our graveyard. So this thing can be huge. And we can play one in a green to return two lands we control to our hands to return Multani from the graveyard to our hands. So Multani is just an absolute unit of a card. It has so much synergy with what the deck is trying to do. It's a massive beater with Trample that can take our opponents out, and it's a really good blocker having reach that can also be recurred by returning lands to our hand and lands that we can then play to get more value out of yeah i think that it's just honestly a strictly better card next up i'm cutting seer sundial for return of the wild speaker seer sundial is a card that i've cut from just about every single deck that i've put it in and i have played a lot of landfall decks um, our commander gives us this effect already for free, and we also have Tatiova, and having to pay 2 mana every time a land comes into play just to draw a card, when we're really wanting to be casting big spells, it's just, it's not really worth it for me. And Return of the Wild Speaker is just so much more impactful in the deck, it takes advantage of all the massive sea creatures and other creatures that we're playing, turning their power into card draw at instant speed is amazing, and also being able to give our creatures plus 3 plus 3 until end of turn to hopefully, you know, end the game is also super useful so i think return of the wild speaker is just an all-around better card and i would suggest getting a bunch of copies of this card before it's crazy expensive all right the last card that i'm cutting is a little bit of a difficult one i'm cutting mold drifter for a card called abundance I really like Mold Drifter. Um, being able to draw two cards for three mana, super good. However, we don't really have any ways of abusing the Mold Drifter's Enter the Battlefield trigger, and I really feel like that's where Mold Drifter that's where Mold Drifter gets broken is when you can repeatedly blink it or reanimate it. The deck doesn't have really a consistent way of doing so, and I really, really, really like Abundance. I think that it is a super underrated card. So Abundance is a four mana enchantment. If you would draw a card, you may instead choose land or non land card and reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a card of the chosen kind you put that card into your hand and the other cards go on the bottom of your library in any order so abundance can give us exactly what we want when we want it if we want lands or if we want non-lands it can give us whatever we choose i feel like that's super useful with our commander and just all the other effects in our deck if we're running low on lands because we've already got a lot in play and we need to heap keep hitting landfall triggers to make more tokens abundance can smooth it out make sure that we get those or if we're flooding out because we have 44 lands in the deck which is a lot abundance can make sure we can hit our non-creature spells um when we need them so i think abundance again is a super underrated card so yeah i i can't speak highly enough of abundance all right, and those are the 11 cards I'm putting in and the 11 cards I'm taking out. And right now we're sitting at about $16, which I feel like is pretty, which is super budget, I feel like. For a $20 product, an extra 16 bucks can upgrade the deck a lot and really make this deck a little bit better. One thing that I would like to mention at this point is you can definitely go a lot further with this deck by playing a bunch of fetch lands, Crucible of Worlds, um, you know, cards like Azusa Lost But Seeking, Wayward Swordtooth, ways of, you know, really playing a lot of extra lands. And that will definitely be really powerful. It's just that is also really expensive. If you guys would like to see us do not so much budget upgrade guides for these videos, we can definitely do that. I hope you guys liked this episode. It was a ton of fun brewing up this list. I'm definitely going to be picking up this deck and making it my own. ASC is a brute of a card. I'm super excited to play it. Let me know down in the comments below if there are any other budget cards that you would have included in this deck or cards that you would have taken out or car or cards that you would have kept in the deck. Be super interested to hear your guys' opinion on that. Another quick reminder, if you guys are interested in becoming a Patreon, you can head on over to patreon.com slash It supports us directly. You get access to ex exclusive content, access to our Discord, super cool merch, and a bunch of other perks. And another reminder that going through the link in the description below to purchase the singles for Commander Legends really helps the channel out a lot and Game Grid now ships nationwide. Another reminder that we that we live stream every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time and you can join us for some Brawl on Arena. And if you haven't followed us on social media yet, our handle is P one and you can like us on Facebook and links for those will be in the description below. Again, thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate all of our subscribers and all of our patrons. You guys are amazing and I hope you guys have an amazing week.